Welcome to the Bunch of Apes podcast. I'm delighted to be joined by my first guest on this relaunch of the podcast. And that is uh, someone who has been on the podcast previously in its previous guise. That's Brianna Pobina. Get that one right? You did. She is a um, paleoanthropologist. Right. Okay. We did this before we kind of went on. A paleoanthropologist. There we go. Do you know, I listened, I listened back to the previous episode and I realised that quite a few times when we were talking about the display at the Smithsonian that you worked on, I called it the oranges of the species quite a few times. <laughs> <laughs> the oranges, the origins, you know. It's just, what, one letter different maybe? maybe I two? guess so. Yeah. It would probably be a very different display if it was the oranges I- of the but, uh, yes, it would be. That's true. <laughs> um, and she has studied in particular early human diet and, you know, specialised in meat eating. Not as in you didn't specialise in eating meat, <laughs> but that's what your specialism was in that area. And we spoke a lot about that on the last podcast. So I kind of wanted to get you back and just cover some different things, really. What have you been up to in terms of your work recently? So obviously I'm not doing much travel or looking at collections or going out to the field um, with COVID, but I've more shifted to writing up projects that I've been working on for a while, um, you know, kind of rebooting some fun ideas about review papers. Um, I'm working with a team that we're, we've been having meetings recently, looking at some fossil collections in Romania, which may or may not have very early evidence for human behavior. Um, So stay tuned for that. But we're trying to figure out, you know, without traveling, how can we continue that research and talking to some potentially new collaborators. Um, And it's, it's an, you know, I'm trying to, to look at the silver lining and figure out what are the projects and ideas that have been simmering that I can revive and do without, um, traveling. Another one that I'm looking forward to is I worked with a collaborator for a couple of years, um, Jennifer Parkinson at University of San Diego, looking at um, a collection, a fossil collection in Texas, um, where it looks like saber tooths were basically dragging animals, remains of their prey back to their den to feed, probably feed their young. And so because I'm interested in meat eating by early humans, but also who they were competing with, which are these big carnivores, Mm. potentially things like saber tooth cats. So we can do modern experiments to see what happens when big cats and hyenas and things chew on bones today, but we don't have saber tooths, unfortunately. I don't know, maybe fortunately, I don't know if I'd want to meet one in a dark alley. but we, this is a really interesting collection because it may preserve evidence for saber tooth, tooth marks and chewing. And so like we have those data, we'll hopefully write them up soon. So it's, it's, I'm trying to make the best of, you know, a situation where like my work has really had to shift. Because mm, last time we spoke, you were, I think you were in Kenya, weren't you? Yeah, it could be. Uh, but yeah, it happens usually at least once or twice a year. So. Uh, but not this year, by all accounts. Not so. this year. No, sadly. Mm, okay. Okay. Um, and, you know, last time we spoke a lot about the, the kind of human diet. Um, and I guess I, I mean, we spoke briefly before we started, but it doesn't, there's not much change there in terms of any sort of big news recently, anything that's happened recently that we're reconsidering. <laughs> Yeah, I would say there haven't been any in the last year or two sort of, you know, big surprises or shifts in what we understand about early human diets. I mean, there are like, you know, sometimes you fit like one extra piece in the puzzle um, mm-hmm. or a neat experiment is done or, you know, a new site is found. But but kind of the the general timeline of when early humans started diversifying their diets, adding more kinds of food, you know, when more meat started coming into the picture, like maybe when, um, harder to find evidence for, but when insects were important, um, you know, maybe when storage and carrying food and, and that kind of thing. So none of that I would say has really shifted significantly. Storage and carrying food then, would that have been 
before Homo sapiens? Or ah, oh, that's a good question. So we don't have good evidence for things like baskets or pottery before Homo sapiens for sure. That's all in the last maybe twenty thousand years. Um, that doesn't mean that people weren't like somehow storing food, maybe drying meat or, um, I don't know, like just carrying things around in gourds, maybe. I mean, some of the first domesticated plants um, and animals actually were probably not domesticated for eating. They were domesticated for other purposes. So early gourds, maybe for carrying water. Um, but the cool thing about um, so baskets, for instance, like anything that is made of fiber is going to degrade really quickly. So it's really hard to find evidence of, of that kind of thing. But um, there are places where you actually have evidence of the impressions of woven baskets on clay that has preserved in the site. So that can say, oh, look, you know, there are people that are weaving and this is probably some kind of food storage. But food storage likely goes along with people settling down and growing their own food because otherwise there's, you know, if you're a forager, there's not necessarily a need for storing a whole bunch of food. Um, but yeah, that oh. all seems to be homo sapiens stuff. Okay. I see. I would have thought if you were foraging and you found a load of stuff and you didn't want to eat it all at once, maybe. Oh, that could be. I mean, if you found a load of, you know, it's either, like berries or nuts or something like that. It's true. Um, and it could be that people were using perishable things like skins or like something, things made of plants to do that kind of carrying and storage. But but definitely like pottery, clay pottery and, and any kind of basketry seems to be a pretty recent invention and seems to only be associated with Homo sapiens. It must be, and this is what you know, fascinates me about speaking to someone like yourself who's actually you know, working within the field and, and has that scientific mind, you kind of probably have to work quite, or I would have to work quite hard to not let my imagination go. Because <laughs> you know, like the the lack of evidence doesn't mean it did happen. If that. Or it didn't. And so that's, yeah. you know, there's a definitely a saying in science like that, you know, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So just because you don't find something doesn't mean it didn't happen. But it also means that like the we don't have evidence to support it. So part of what I think a lot about both in my own research, but also when I'm trying to like communicate to, you know, different audiences is what kind of evidence would we need to answer that question? Mm -hmm. Sometimes the answer to that, like sometimes that is we will never have the kind of evidence that we need because, you know, DNA doesn't preserve that long or soft tissue doesn't preserve that long. Or like, would I like to dig up a gut microbiome of Homo erectus? Oh yeah, but that's not going to happen. <laughs> I mean, I want to know, like, would I like to dig up sort of a, you know, find a mummy of, you know, early Homo and see what was in its stomach? That'd be amazing. But the likelihood of that happening is not, it's not going to happen. Not going to find so, yeah, so I, somewhere, no. Well, so, I mean, absolutely. And, and let's see, the Iceman is a wonderful example of like finding a, you know, a frozen, you know, modern human and just learning a wealth of information about what he ate and how he hunted and maybe how he died and that kind of thing. The problem is for the species that I'm interested in, which is, which are the kind of early Homo, Homo erectus, that kind of thing. We're just, they all lived in tropical areas mostly. Yeah. Um, so we're really unlikely to find a lot of genetic evidence, unlikely to find like preserved soft things like their tissues, you know, evidence of stuff that they ate except for fossil bones. So yeah, so I really think a lot about like, how would I answer that question with evidence? What kind of evidence would I need? It, you know, can I find, we could do, I mean, there's nothing wrong with scientists, I think, speculating and using our imaginations and maybe we'll come up with a, oh, I hadn't thought about, I could do a butchery experiment to figure out how to answer that question. Um, mm -hmm. But it is, it's hard to like, I think some of us, you know, we have our sort of I don't know, particular ideas that we're really interested in supporting or refuting. And sometimes you just can't. So you can put things out there, but say like, we don't have any evidence for this. And so I think as long as we're honest about that, then it, that's fine. Mm. Yeah. So you, I guess you, you, you label it as a speculation and then you label the things that you know, I guess. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Okay. And it, just going, just to rewind quickly, the, the impressions of baskets that, that you said have been found, how early is that then? Is that 
pre-homo sapien or no it's definitely homo sapiens i don't remember the exact dates but i there's sometime between 10 and 20 000 years ago okay. um maybe maybe a bit older but definitely homo sapiens um so not yeah. your specialism then which, which kind of early homin, hom, hominids is that the right word? early or hominin? hominin hominin now hominin. yeah hominin. Mm-hmm. why is that is that like a what's what's the difference Uh, Good question between hominid and hominin. So hominid used to be the term that we use for like all ancient extinct humans, basically everything more closely related to us than chimpanzees. But now because um, modern humans and chimpanzees are actually more closely related to each other, we know that genetically than even chimps are to gorillas and orangutans. Mm. And so the, you know, the, so we're the the sort of subfamily homininae is what we use to talk about modern humans and all of our extinct relatives, like on that branch of the family tree. So we've got more Um, than a chimp to go in common with a gorilla. From a genetic perspective, yeah. Well, from a, I've seen, I've seen people that look like behaviorally and visually <laughs> from a perspective. I, I hazard a guess, but there you go. <laughs> uh, modern human variation is a wonderful thing. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah. So which so you which hominin? Yeah. Are you, so so I would I would say I'm most interested in and familiar with Homo erectus. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's because, so it evolved just after 2 million years ago, was around until maybe as recently as 140,000 years ago. So it's actually the longest lived hominin on the human family tree, but it's the the hominin, really the time period from which we have evidence of increasing meat eating. Homo erectus is also the first hominin to migrate out of Africa. So I think there's interesting questions to ask about like, when Homo erectus moved into different environments, like what kinds of foods were they eating? How did they, like, did they just follow migrating animals? What happens when they found totally new plants? Um, And they, you know, the fossil record, at least for now, shows that soon after they migrated migrated out of Africa, they made it to Southeast Asia. So like, what were, where were, like, what was that path? And what were they doing in all those places? Mm -hmm. And so... Um, because of a variety of things, because of like just geological preservation, because of the ability of people to go explore different places. We don't have like, you know, I can't draw with a Sharpie exactly where that migration route was, but we have a couple of sites, you know, we have some sites in different places that we can start to kind of piece together what that was like. The other thing that's important to remember is there probably wasn't one like, hi, I'm holding up a flag and we're migrating now. There probably wasn't one migration that just was deliberate. It was probably a lot of expansion and contraction of home ranges. And, you know, when modern humans left Africa, there's really good evidence that there were pulses and waves of modern humans leaving Africa. Um, And then sometimes those populations didn't persist. Like they made it maybe to the Middle East and that was it. Like they, that population died out. So there's no reason to think that didn't happen also with, with earlier humans too. That's that's always a, a point that fascinates me is is trying to think and maybe there's evidence either way maybe you can clear that up but was it a case of you've got all these homo erectus homo erecti with that i don't know <laughs> no, <laughs> homo erectuses i guess yeah <laughs> all, all in africa and perhaps because of resources and running out of food they just get pushed close and close to the coast and one of them goes oh there's a tree over there let's go across or is it someone with a conscious thought kind of going, hmm, what's that? What What is over there? You know, do you know what I mean? Like, a, a... I do. And it's, that's exactly the kind of thing, like fascinating questions. We will probably never, without a time yeah. machine, we will never know the answers to like why things happen. I mean, we even see, you know, modern animals, it, people who study primates, it's like, you know, can you really figure out what they're thinking and why they made their choices? You might be able to look at like, you know, ecological factors or, or social factors, but like, you know, it's really hard to get into the mind of mm. another creature. Did you watch Rise of the Warrior Apes? Because like, I that's did what, not. Oh, it's, it's been two years, bro. You've got no excuse and lots of <laughs> That's but true. Again, chimps that eat loads of meat. So one of them, again, like maybe could it be one? I know you're saying it probably wasn't one migration, but in, 
if you sort of humanize it in human culture, it can often be like one leader or one person that says, we're all going to do this and they're convincing enough and everyone does it. But do we know that, I mean, do we know enough about home erectors to say they probably didn't have that, those levels of communication or? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So communication and language is like, I feel like sort of a big black box in mm. our, you know, knowledge about the past. There's some really interesting speculation. Um, I, I wrote a blog post with um, a professor at Columbia University um, in, on psychology today about like whether Homo erectus has language and you know, it depends on how you define language and it depends on what kind of sophisticated, sophisticated communication we might envision. I mean, even vervet monkeys, primates, you know, or arboreal tree living little monkeys in, in Africa have different calls for different predators, different alarm calls. So if, you know, this means snake and this means leopard and, you know, so is that language? Um, I'm, I, you know, I'm not a linguist, so I can't necessarily make those arguments, but, but um, the, some of the, like, as you get later in time, some of the really sophisticated um, uh, symbolic behavior you see, particularly with homo sapiens and modern humans, but even with Neanderthals, maybe with, with even maybe homo heidelbergensis, I mean, it's hard to imagine people like you know, 20 feet up on a cave wall painting a half human, half animal thing that they've never seen before and that there's no language involved mm. in that kind of, you know, I don't know. I guess there's almost an argument that the, the desire to express in an artistic form is a, is a communication beyond what you're needing. You know, it's, it's a... Exactly. And it's, it's, you know, is it sort of group bonding? Is it a way to deal with the uncertainty of the world around you? Um, you know, is it a way to like, there's a lot of, of interesting, particularly in Southern Africa sort of looks like, you know, cave paintings and, and drawings that have to do with hunting and things. And so is it, but does that mean it's only about like going and getting food or really does it have a big social aspect and, and, you know, um, cultural aspect. And so the culture part, like I, I usually do research before the culture part. I, you know, I, I think of the early humans that I'm, you know, studying like Homo erectus and, and Homo habilis and other early Homo is kind of operating more like animals than like modern people. So okay. the, the rules are a bit different in a sense, or at least we don't have that. There's not the extra layer of culture on top of that. Hmm. So going back then to diet um, and mm -hmm. Homo erectus, I mean, I know you, when we spoke last time, you were talking about the, I think, a bit earlier. So maybe the Australopithecus and the, I've got, I'm not going to lie, because you can see I'm looking over here. I've got a book. Um, <laughs> I'm referencing the, the, that kind <laughs> of thing. Yeah. You were talking about scavenging meat quite a lot. But Homo erectus, there's evidence of hunting. Is that right? Well, that's a good, I mean, Homo erectus spans a long period of time. I actually think the earliest meat eating in Homo erectus was very likely also scavenging. Okay. Um, so for, for here's the, here's the evidence of absence is maybe, or maybe not absence of evidence. So we don't have evidence for hunting tools until half a million years ago. Um, though the, the earliest hunting tools are um, stone spear points from a site called Katupan in South Africa. We know they were hunting tools. We know they were basically probably put on the end of wooden shafts and used for hunting because they have what are called diagnostic impact fractures on their tips. Basically, through experiments, you know, we know that they were used for like it, for projectile. Um, or not projectile weapons like arrows, but, but for at the end of spears, they were used for hunting. But before half a million years ago, we don't have convincing evidence that any early humans were hunting from their technology. Um, so I think it's likely that they were doing some kind of scavenging. There's different kinds of scavenging. There's passive scavenging, which is like, it's just what it sounds like. You just wait until something's available and it's not dangerous and you go eat the leftovers. But then there's also active or confrontational or power scavenging, and that's chasing carnivores off of kills. And 
I think, I think we're still trying to work out how we might be able to tell the difference between those things from the archaeological evidence. Okay. But I get, I get, so then assuming that, I'm assuming that the evidence for hunting was also in Homo erectus at half a million years ago. So, um, so I, you know, I'm not, I don't know what species that was. It could have been Homo heidelbergensis, um, but it could, so. so we don't really mark. know if Homo erectus actually hunted for its meat or not. Correct. I think that probably later in time, potentially, um, but it's hard because a lot of, we find archaeological sites with stone tools and maybe even with fossil animals that have been butchered, but we don't find a hominin there. So we don't know who made it or uh -huh. who did that. So there's, there's not a lot of sites where we find um, early human fossils alongside with the stone tools or the animals that they butchered. And even when we do, if a site spans, you know, 50,000 years of time, you know, maybe it was a different, there are a lot of sites that have stone tools that have species, fossils of species in them that we think probably weren't making stone tools. Mm. So. Well, a good cave's a good cave, isn't it? So if someone, one person's living in it, then maybe the next lot are living, you know, it's, it's a good place to live. Yeah, exactly. So, because I, I guess one of the things, because I was, I'm, I think we met, I mentioned to you before, I'm quite late to even being interested about this stuff and prehistory and, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I remember, I always remember like at school briefly covering that sort of standardized model, the sort of linear, you know, is a monkey, is a slightly standing up monkey, is a hairy man, you know, all person, you know, business, yep. that kind of thing. And I think that, the biggest misleading thing apart from well, lots of misleading things about that but what i love the fact that you know when you actually look into it there were loads of different species knocking around at the same time and it would be really interesting if, if you're saying that your instinct maybe is that homo erectus did eventually start hunting you could kind of you could almost suggest that that would have been influenced by potentially other species and there would be like a cult cultural transfer of information across species maybe it could be i mean i think particularly even later in time there are um you know during the last hundred thousand years um modern humans and neanderthals lived in the same areas in europe and western asia and they even there's good evidence that from some of the same cave sites you can tell that there were Neanderthal tools and then there were modern human tools and then there were Neanderthal tools. And then there were, so there was a back and forth probably with just climates shifting. Neanderthals like colder environments than modern humans did. And so, um, and certainly we know that there was exchange between modern humans and Neanderthals, they interbred. Um, yep. So there was definitely, you know, whether you call that cultural exchange or not, but you know, you know, is artistic expression in Neanderthals a product of them just watching what modern humans were doing? Um, or is it something that was, you know, intrinsic to them um, as their own species? You know, it's a really good, it's, it's another thing we might never know. But, but I think if we, you know, we design research questions that can get closer and closer to those answers. So, we, so um, going back to sort of early diet again, then. What, so I know... Um, I've, I've seen programs where they would take uh, like a more recent um, fossil find or skeletal find and they'll do things like drill out DNA from the tooth and stuff like that. Presumably the, the area that you're looking at, you know, millions and millions of years ago, like say Homo erectus is, uh, when did you say first around? Just after two million years. So presumably like DNA one. doesn't last that long. Well, so it can in the right environment. Oh, wow. Um, so, yeah. And so, tr so in environments that are maybe not quite that long, but environments that are cold and dry are really good for preserving DNA. Hmm. Um, the oldest DNA that like is on record is from a 700,000 year old horse fossil in Europe. Um, and so, and there are even early humans, um, either probably early, early Neanderthals from Spain where DNA has been extracted, but there's also not, so genetic evidence is not just DNA. There are, you, we can look for ancient proteins. And so there are ancient proteins that are dated a few million years ago. Um, uh -huh. But again, those are from places like, you know, species like camels in the Arctic. And so 
which is weird, um, but <laughs> <laughs> just camels in the Arctic. Yes. Um, but cold, dry environments is the key. And so we're much more likely to get evidence from um, species and animals and things that are living in those environments. That said, one of the cooler studies that I have seen in the last five years or so, um, there was a site that was excavated in a, basically an ancient desert oasis in Jordan. Um, so super dry now. It was a, you know probably green and full of animals about 250,000 years ago, which is when this evidence is from. And this study was led by um, April Noel of University of Victoria, I think, in British Columbia. So they dug up this archaeological site and they found a lot of stone tools um, and they actually looked at the edges of stone tools and tried to extract residues to find ancient proteins and it turns out that out of the 44 tools they decided to test 17 of them actually had ancient protein residue like animal blood on them and wow. they could tell what species they were used to butcher so every tool only had the blood from one kind of animal and it was everything from uh, like wild cattle to ducks to rhinos to horses, and I think camels as well. So I think that like there is, you know, in some sense, like genetics and Asian DNA is a real cutting edge, haha, of um, <laughs> early uh, human studies, you know, everything from like evolutionary relationships to thinking about behavior and diet. So that study was super cool going, you know, quarter of a million years ago, we literally know that these tools were used to butcher these kinds of animals. That's awesome. Wow. But I guess that is amazing. I didn't know that. Um, but I guess, whereas you can take a skeleton or fossil, well, it's not a fossil, is it? It's just a skeleton from, say, I don't know, ancient Rome or early history. And you can almost, I think you can pretty much figure out exactly what their diet was. You, you can't so, do that. Well, you, so you can, there are, if you um, look, extract, look, you know, either look at the teeth or mm -hmm. the, the bones of even early human fossils, and we can do this much further back even than human evolution, you can actually look at the at different kinds of isotopes of different elements to get a sense of some broad strokes of what diet was. So one thing we can do is look at carbon isotopes, even from fossils, to get a sense of whether the kinds of plants or the kinds of animals that were eating those plants are from more open grassland environments or more wooded environments. And so this is done really commonly to reconstruct the habitat preferences, like what kinds of environments were these species living in? We can look at their carbon isotopes to say they lived in more open grasslands or they lived in more wooded environments because um, basically because the, the photosynthetic pathways of C4 grasses and C3 leafy plants are different and those end up in the chemical signatures even of the fossils. So that can definitely tell us a little something about diet. What I can't tell us is whether those early humans or hominins were eating C3 or C4 plants or they were eating animals that were eating those C3 or C4 plants. But there's another isotope system that can tell us that, and that's nitrogen isotopes. And the basically the concentration of nitrogen isotopes increases as you go up the tr trophic chain. So within and it's all relative to your specific like ecosystem or environment so like the plants will have lower levels of nitrogen isotopes the animals that eat the plants will have higher levels and then the um, animals that eat the animals that eat the plants will have higher levels and this is um so a lot of nitrogen isotope work has been done on Neanderthals. There's great archaeological evidence that Neanderthals were big game hunters, ate a lot of animal protein, and the nitrogen isotopes totally supports that. So the nitrogen isotope levels in a lot of Neanderthals is the same as the like apex predators in their environment. So whether wow. it's like saber tooth or, you know, big cats or things like that, like Neanderthals are eaten this similar, they're in a similar trophic level to those big predators. So there are ways to get, it's kind of, it's broad categories. It's not like how much of one thing did they eat versus the other or what specific things that they eat, but we can get at some of that with, um, by extracting tiny bits of um, material from either teeth or fossil skeletons. So you can kind of posit that well, not positive, you can almost prove that, well, you can prove that Neanderthals were pretty much predominantly carnivores. 
Yeah, they certainly, of all the early humans, they ate more meat than anybody else. And they, interestingly, so yes, I would say they were predominantly carnivores, but um, also in recent times, there have been more and more studies that show that they also ate a pretty wide variety of plants, probably everything that was available in their like cold ice age environments, which wouldn't have been a lot of plants. But um, Amanda Henry, um, uh, when she was a graduate student at George Washington University, some of her PhD research was extracting little bits of plant microfossils from Neanderthal teeth to figure out what kinds of plants did they eat. And they ate a lot of different kinds of plants, ancestors of wild grains, um, and some of the plants that they ate were cooked. And you can tell that by the shape of those ancient starch grains or phytoliths. So they, uh, they change shape when you cook them. Yeah. I mean, not surprising because we know that Neanderthals routinely used fire and they lived in really cold places. So, but it's cool to be able to actually demonstrate, uh-huh, they ate this variety of plants and they cooked them as well. And some of the plants that they ate, interestingly, um, seem to maybe have some medicinal value. So maybe they were eating them not because maybe they were like, oh, I have a really bad hot. stomach ache and I know that this plant is good for making me feel better. So. Or getting high. Uh, could be so <laughs> <laughs> that's right um with, so with with homo erectus then is there enough to suggest whether they were more heavily meat more heavily plant or is it hard to tell because you don't know if the uh, plant is it isotopes are coming from eating meat yeah so so i don't think there's i don't think that the um nitrogen isotope either work has been done or whether that preserves um, that far back in the fossil record. It's a good question. I know that the, the carbon um, isotope work, um, you know, it's interesting because the, a lot of the species that were living at the same time as Homo erectus, which are paranthropus, and these are these like giant toothed, big jawed, hominins with the sagittal crest in the middle that looks like a bony mohawk um yeah. they certainly <laughs> seem to be <laughs> what i've got a like family tree of all the hominids here and i'm looking at a picture and it's that is it boso one of them oh. Paranthropus boisei, that's the one in East yeah. africa Paranthropus robustus is in south africa they sort of fill the same niche and so that's they the seem to yeah, they seem to be eating um, much more C4, like open grassland plants, and they were doing a lot of chewing and things like that. Um, Homo erectus seems to be a little bit more of a like versatile list. They kind of eat plants from a part like across the spectrum, which in, you know, makes sense with their, they seem to be the first early uh, hominin or human to kind of really broaden their diets and eat food from different Wait, places. Is probably why they were able to go as far as they did because without you know with a narrow diet you, you can't leave your um your habitat really can you because you can't go from a a dry sort of open plain habitat to a tropical jungle and eat the same stuff so exactly so like specialists not so successful oftentimes i mean specialists who are living in an environment that is unchanging so things like i don't know sharks you know mm. they're fine and they've been around for hundreds of millions of years but but a lot of times for, you know, for terrestrial animals, being a specialist is not a good means to a, a good end, I guess. It, it's funny because when we did um, the, 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 sh the episode before, it was about two years ago, and I was, I was getting quite upset with vegans. I don't know if you remember, but I tried to sort of con you into saying vegans are stupid, but we disproved <laughs> that because uh, the, what was it called? The, um, uh Oh, the brain, expensive tissue hypothesis. Expensive yeah. tissue hypothesis was a bit didn't quite marry up, but it was more about cooking food that helped with brain development. So we we did I think agree that people that eat raw foods are stupid. Or maybe that was just me agreeing that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so raw. I mean, just eating raw foods is actually really like it, for you know women, it's really difficult. It, you will often not menstruate. So wow. um, not a good reproductive strategy for like carrying on your species if you're a raw food eater. <laughs> Definitely not. So. Um, so back then, you know, I, I was on a sort of anti-vegan crusade. Um, but now I've had a slightly different shift in a lot of my friends are kind of espousing these ancient diets where it's all about eating meat all the time. And that's what we've right. done. And the 
again, it just every time I speak to you, it just it just rings true that actually versatility of diet is everything about particularly even being homo sapien because we're the ones that carried on that survived everywhere because of our versatility but the one that i wanted to check in with you and i don't know what you're like with maths and i've been trying to do the maths on this but there's a bit of a facebook post going around that says that's kind of trying to back this up and it says if you look at a, a human existence being a 24-hour clock we've only been eating grains wheat and blah 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 for the last five minutes and I swear, I tried to do the maths and I, I think I figured out that that person was referring to possibly Homo erect, going back as far as like Homo erectus, which is ridiculous because that's a different species. So you can't really say, well, for five minutes of human existence, we've been eating. No, it's, <laughs> but yeah. I don't know. I don't know if you can do the maths that quickly, but I, I, I probably can't because um, math isn't my strong point. But I will say the idea that we've only been eating X food for a certain amount of time, therefore it's not good for us. I say, uh-uh, um, because there's really good evidence that modern humans adapt really quickly to dietary changes. You know, 7,000 years ago, modern humans could not digest milk as adults. We, we can digest it as babies for nursing, um, but you know, around, Around 7,000 years ago, there was a big shift with the advent of keeping animals for food. Um, milk is a great source. Animal milk is a great source of protein, of fat, of clean liquid. Um, and there was strong selection pressure for the ability to drink milk. There are three different mutations in modern humans, totally different mutations in different populations that kept meat, that kept animals for food and for milk eventually. Um, 7,000 years. That is not a long period of time in order for, you know, now a third of the people on the planet can digest milk as adults are basically lactose tolerant. So, um, so, uh, you know, the idea that, you know, and, and there's also evidence for processing of grains that goes back like 30,000 years. Um, uh -huh. So there's also evidence from different modern human populations that, that populations that eat high starch diets actually have a higher number of copies of a gene that um, basically expresses as um, uh, like a substance in your saliva that, have, that helps you break down starch. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how old that um, copy number mutation is um, variability, but you know, even in modern human populations, high starch diets, more copy numbers of this gene, um, this amylase, starch amylase gene. So the idea that like, you know, we are who we were 30,000 years ago and there's been no evolution since then is not true. Um, and, the, and also, you know, the conception that because our ancestors didn't eat it, we shouldn't eat it today. Like we are completely, we have a completely different food landscape. Um, you know, it's funny because a lot of the paleo diet or ancient diet movements are all about excluding food. And I always joke like, what early human, I'm sorry, even what modern human 10 or 20,000 years ago is going to look at something edible and go, no, I'm not going to eat that. <laughs> no, that's not how it works. So no, I think you have it exactly right. The versatility and the expansion of diet seems to been have been a real hallmark of modern humans that probably led to a lot of our success and i guess it would be likely then that a diet that works for you would be really dependent on your ancestral lineage where you where most of your ancestors came from you know so actually because again you know and i, I said this to, to my friend i said well you know go and tell um someone from southeast asia that eating rice is bad for you well you know they, they laugh at you <laughs> it doesn't... exactly or you know tell tell a you know the maasai who we work with that right along with in kenya that like you shouldn't be drinking milk which is a big yeah. part of their diet so um no exactly i and you're a like even personal kind of genetic makeup which is you know in part in large part determined by your ancestry. Like a diet that is optimal for me is not gonna be the same as a diet that's optimal for you. It's not gonna be the same as a diet that's optimal for someone else. And the other thing is like, what does healthy mean? Are we trying to lose weight? Are we trying to be heart healthy? Are we trying to like be, you know, Look shredded like live a to a hundred? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, it also depends on in a sense what your goals are. And sometimes those goals can be conflicting, so.
I'm going for the caveman look, but that's mainly just the, the beard and the hair. So you know. it works. <laughs> <laughs> my wife, I was watching a program the other day with my wife on Neanderthals. It was like an Alice Roberts one, Alice Roberts one where they reconstructed one out of you know the, they they put obviously tissue on the bones and stuff, and she just kept doing bloody double takes. It's like will you stop doing that. <laughs> It's well, you know, <laughs> all, all basically all people who who don't have ancestry from Africa. So like all of us, you know, um, particularly those of us that are descended from Europeans, we have a little bit of Neanderthal DNA in us. It just varies how much. Yeah, see, I was aware of that and I went into check and I there's a, like a an ancient um, DNA calculator. You can put your. DNA heritage so I did my heritage test uh-huh put it into this ancient DNA calculator and I um and I worked it out and it came out as somewhere between three to four percent and I thought well, that doesn't sound like it's not a lot but then I looked into it that's quite a lot it's on the higher <laughs> end yeah, it is higher <laughs> end. again yeah. I, I was saying to my wife it's just the long hair and the beard and she's saying no no it's the sloping forehead um, it's the brow the ridges area. a little bit yep <laughs> Are you with her? What? I'm not. No, sorry. What? <laughs> right, that's it. I'm so annoyed. I'm going to go outside and skin an animal <laughs> just to calm down. <laughs> no, um, where were we? What were we talking about before? Now? Oh, the diet. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess I would say that, like, for, for those people, because I, I, I'm going to share this with the person I was speaking to about this, um, and I would agree with them on the idea that maybe, um, the less processed food you know eating foods from their original source vegetables yes. straight off the tree grains that have only been processed once because i know you're saying thirty thousand years ago they were processing but they wouldn't have been refining added in exactly sugar. no and for sure i mean i would not argue that that like those are those foods will have you know more nutrients they will have less kind of filler calories and so absolutely i mean that's going to be you know, in all sense of the word, I think healthier, um, you know, not having a diet of like potato chips and I don't know, something but then, else. Do you think because of the way natural selection works and because we are such an adaptable species, if you hypothesize that because of lockdown, all that became available on the food chain was Doritos and everyone just had to live off Doritos, at some point, would the human species be able to evolve and adapt to just live off Doritos? We'd look the terrible. Thing- <laughs> it would take i love doritos it's it, you know <laughs> you, don't exclu- you don't exclusively live off them so you don't know no exactly and you know um so would we it's a you know would we be able to adapt to just eating doritos i don't know I, there some things might go awry sorry um, that's not a question i sent you in the prep sheet <laughs> <laughs> no that's fine um but it you know it is a good question and i and i will say the the ancient evidence I would use to answer that or that is that when um, different populations of modern humans first started to domesticate plants and animals and when we went down to a really when certain populations went down to like mostly living off one or two kinds of plants that was not a good recipe for health so um, it's still like no. variety so so there's good evidence that people got like stature got shorter, you know, people just were generally unhealthier because they didn't have, because usually one or two plant sources can't provide all of your necessary nutrients. So, so as long as they had different flavors of Doritos, like you had the cool original, the spicy heat ones, then maybe. Um, I I don't know about that. Um, yeah. (laughs) I love that you managed to tie in some ancient evidence to that ridiculous question. So well done. <laughs> well done. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Speaking of ridiculous questions, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna try and end every show with a series of quick fire questions. Um, okay, I'm ready. All fairly appropriate. One's a little bit risque, but you know, you can always you can always pass. You have a pass. You can pass. Okay. Anything. All right. Okay. Right. So, what is your favorite hominin? Homo erectus. Homo erectus. Okay. Yeah. If you could go back to one period of time, where would you go? I would probably go to about 2 million years ago when Homo erectus is start, or, you know, whoever's around at that time is really starting to eat more significant amounts of meat. What I would want to see, I would want to watch them 
go after animals and I would want to watch the paranthropists that were hanging around at the same places in the same time. Like, what are they doing that's different? I still want to know what paranthropists is eating. I think that's a question mark. The different lines of evidence that we use for diet point to different things. So. Mm, okay. I said these were quick fire, but now I want to know more about that. But I better, I better count. <laughs> okay. If you could go back, but the cost was, and you could take your family, but you had to stay there. Do you think you would? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. I think about that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, could I like send information to the future so that it wouldn't just be me and my intellectual satisfaction of getting the answers to these about questions? It, you couldn't do that, but you could because you could write it in some way that you knew would perhaps. So you could leave little messages. Oh, I could have like messages in a bottle for the future. I, that'd be really You're tempting. Sp- I'm. You could be like I'm not as well because they would. You'd be like, oh look, here's some fire. I'm wearing some clothes. Do you want? I'd also this? be hosed because I'd be like, I don't know how to find food two million years ago in Homo erectus land. So <laughs> it'd be know. a risky one, wouldn't it? It'd be a risky one. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'd, I'd be the first picked off by the saber tooth cats. I think. <laughs> potentially potentially <laughs> but you could start a fire though way better than that always works in the films doesn't it <laughs> uh, definitely okay um if you were going to recommend one book to someone interested in this area and let's say i think to say prehistory is probably a little bit of a big area so let's say the human diet um actually i will right? I will go. No. So I don't have a book yet, although I'd really like to write one. Um, Actually, I will go to a broader human evolution. So the book that I now recommend hands down for anybody interested in all aspects of human evolution is called The Creative Spark by Augustin Fuentes. And it is uh, published in the last couple of years. It is a wonderful, um, you know, very readable, accessible basically romp through all of human evolution prehistory it's fantastic okay excellent okay uh what was my last one? Oh, the last one was the risque one so you go back in time uh it happens to be around the time of the neanderthals you know you you're lonely one of them is really attractive would you do you think they are really attractive neanderthal and that's not a proposition i'm married by the way so. <laughs> <laughs> um I mean, if I was by myself, you know, <laughs> uh, you know what? I would follow what my early modern human ancestors did. And that that's would, a yes, then. That's, I think so. <laughs> I think so. Although we never know which way around it was, because I don't know. Maybe, do you think it's sexist for me to say that Neanderthal man, I could see that happening, but. I've looked at some mock-ups of Neanderthal women and I'm not so sure I'd be as keen, but then... Do I think that's sexist? Yes, but that's okay. okay. <laughs> no, I, would, no, I won't say it then, definitely not. All right. Of course. <laughs> Thanks again, Brianna. Um, for, is there anything you're working on doing, happening that you want to draw people's attention to? Um, not at the moment, but just um, I would love to... to suggest that people follow the Human Origins Program's Facebook and Twitter accounts. We're at Human Origins on Twitter and we're Smithsonian's Human Origins Program on Facebook. So if you're interested in all things human evolution, um, check out what we post there on social media. And I would just, I mean, I haven't seen the social media stuff as much recently, but I did go on the website for the Smithsonian a while back and it's fantastic free resource. So yeah. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you. Humanorigins.si.edu. And we are upgrading to a new version of our web platform probably by the end of the year. So and that is human origins, not human oranges. Correct. So very clear. That's a very different website. Um, bit niche that one. Uh, <laughs> thanks yeah. again, Brianna. And thanks everyone for listening. Um, this is Bunch of Apes. If you have any suggestions about people we could talk to or you would like to come on the show and you have something to tell us about in the area of prehistory, I might even dabble into ancient history because I'm quite interested in that too. Um, Or actually also anything to do with apes, monkeys, chimpanzees, love all that as well. Um, The email address is bunchofapes at gmail.com. So get in touch. Also be great to hear any feedback you've got as well. Please like, please share, do all that social media stuff. It will help and it will help me get fantastic guests like Brianna back on the show. All right. Thank you, everybody.